everything you wanted to know about Vincent Price, but were too afraid to ask. <laughs> I don't have a picture of my childhood swing oh, set, so I didn't borrow one. When I was six years old, I was sitting on the swing set in our backyard in the city, and this group of, this group of, uh, that on? There we go. A group of kids from across the street who were old and came over. They started telling me about this movie they'd just seen down at the Capitol Theater on Main Street. And it was about this guy who was trying to bring this woman back from the dead. There was this casket, and I was sitting there enthralled. And I had no idea what movie they were talking about until years later. It was The Haunted Palace. With oh, yeah. Vincent Price and Lon Chaney came here. And the lady on the right is Kathy Merchant. And Kathy Merchant and I got to know each other on Facebook a few years ago. And she told me all these stories about making a movie with Vincent Price. The fact that Lon Chaney Jr. used to make chili in his dressing room. <laughs> she passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately. She was a beautiful lady. <clears throat> As I grew older, I, I catch up with other Vincent Price movies, House on Haunted Hill. How many people see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The best. Everybody sees that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Tingler. Yeah. That's the one where they actually rigged up the seats in the theater so they buzz to scare people. <laughs> yeah. William Castle is a crazy director. House of Wax. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was his first full blown horror film. Uh, made, uh, 1952, and it was the first major 3D movie to do. And it still comes out from time to time in 3D. In it, he played a, a sculptor of beautiful things who becomes horribly disfigured and starts coating people with wax and putting them in his wax. <laughs> uh, Hollywood Square. Yeah. Vincent Price was on TV all the time when I was a kid. We couldn't miss him. He was on. He was on. Hollywood Square is a total of 368 times. Wow. Now, who is he? Where did he come from? Well, his grandfather, no. <laughs> his grandfather was uh, Vincent Clarence Price. He came from Troy, New York. And he was the inventor of baking powder. The same baking powder we use today. Baking powder and all the other cooking aids made him a millionaire. He started out as a patent medicine doctor, medically a doctor, but he made a lot of money out of people looking for cures. But this stuff was real and made him a millionaire. <clears throat> this is father, Vincent Leonard Price. He had a good buddy back when he was growing up named Richard Wells. Richard Wells was the father of Orson Wells. Okay. Can you go back to that slide before? What's happening over on the right? They were amateur magicians. Oh. And it's a very poorly done movie. <laughs> They're sticking their head through the curtain. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. But it works, you know? <laughs> uh, Vincent's father was the uh, owner of the National Candy Company in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, that's the building as it looks today. It, it's now owned by U Hall, I think. But it's a, it's a beautiful building, some of the detail on the right still exists. And he was the one of the wealthiest men in the United States at one time. Into this family was born Vincent Leonard Price Jr. Uh, he was born May 27, 1911, the youngest of four children. Uh, he was even used to be advertising to the candy company and became known as the Candy Kid. <laughs> This is their home in St. Louis. Uh, it's now owned by Washington University. Now, when Vincent was uh, young, he became extremely interested in art, all kinds of art. When he was 12, he purchased a Rembrandt etching. He went into this shop, saw this Rembrandt etching, talked it over with the shop owner, saved his allowance, paid it out over uh, installments, and bought this Rembrandt etching. It was the beginning of a whole life of appreciation of the arts. Do we know the value of that? <laughs> I don't think so. Did they, did they know the value? Did he know the value at the time? At the time he did. Okay, yes. so he knew what he was buying. Oh, he knew. Oh, okay. Wow. On the left is Vincent Price on an archaeological expedition with a group of friends. He's holding a skull, which sort of tells you where he was headed as far as the movie career goes. <laughs> um, but he was interested in all things ancient art, uh, archaeology, the sciences, 
you name it, it's just all over the place. His school, the St. Louis Country Day School, still in existence and uh, offered him a lot of opportunities to see things outside of the St. Louis area as well. There he is on the left uh, in high school, touring Europe with his uh, fellow classmates on an arts tour of the continent. A friend of mine actually purchased his travel diary from that time uh, and in it are all kinds of hints of where he was going culturally. Uh, he said, my first trip abroad will be, I hope, just a starter on a long life built with voyages, and it certainly was. He attended Yale. Uh, after graduating from that, he went to London, where he attended the Courtauld Institute of Art. Uh, he was also bitten by the theater bug when he was there. He got his first role in a, in a play called Chicago, where he played a cop who could chew gum and walk at the same time. That is, that's how he said he got the part. He was the only actor able to do that. So, his second role, he went right to the top. He won the lead role of Prince Albert in Lawrence Houseman's Victoria Regina. Opposite him was Helen Hayes, who was called the First Lady of American Theater. Uh, he was a sensation. Uh, when the play crossed the Atlantic, he came with it. Helen Hayes convinced him to uh, ignore the call from Hollywood and so he mastered the stage. So he took a couple of years and she just appeared on stage all over the, the Northeast, especially up in Maine, Lakewood Theater. And on the left is a program for a play that he actually wrote, uh, which I don't think has been uh, produced since. Oh, it's Warner. Warner. Did his family support him in, in this? Absolutely. They did. His, his dad kept all kinds of scrapbooks. <coughs> While he was in Lakewood, he met uh, Edith Barrett, an actress, who was very well known at the time, much more than he was. And the two were married in 1938 in New York City. He joined uh, the Orson Welles Mercury Theater in New York and appeared several times with his dad's, uh, his dad's old friend's son, Orson. Uh, he uh, built up his resume that way. But Hollywood continued to beckon, and he eventually gave in, especially when he received a particular opportunity. He actually auditioned for the part of Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind. And as we know, he didn't get it, but it certainly brought his name to the attention of the studios. His first film was by Universal Pictures, called Service Deluxe. Uh, it's a screwball comedy. It paired him with Constance Bennett, who, uh, Joan Bennett's sister, uh, who uh, was a very well-known comic actress at the time. And that was his film debut. Unfortunately, the, the genre of screwball comedy was kind of falling by the wayside. It was really popular in the early 30s, not so much by the late 30s. The film didn't do really well. So he was sort of looking for, for projects after that. Uh, and nobody knew how to cast him. He was a romantic type, he could do comedy, but nobody knew how to cast him. One problem was he was too tall. He was 6'4", and so he dwarfed all the sleepy ladies. Uh, he appeared in historical dramas such as The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex, with Becky Davis and Harold Flynn. Here he is as Sir Walter Raleigh. Then he was in Tower of London as the ill-fated Duke of Clarence. And in that film, he ends up drowned in a vat of wine by Basil Rathbone and Boris Karloff. <laughs> <laughs> for days, they filled that vat with cigarette butts, Coke bottles, everything they could <clears throat> just to make it miserable for <laughs> He then went on to play The Invisible Man and The Invisible Man Returns. Of course, the only problem with playing The Invisible Man is he hardly ever see the face. He's all in bandages. <clears throat> Except right at the climax, he makes an appearance and then he dies. <laughs> He went on to do House of Seven Gables, which was a return to romantic roles, and it gave him a chance to sing. He had to sing a song in the film. But in real life, he'd become a father. His son, Vincent Barrett Price, was born in about 1949. He then went back to Broadway and starred in an incredibly successful play called Angel Street, which was later filmed as Gaslight. 
he plays a husband who's trying to drive his wife crazy. He, uh, it's his first truly villainous role, and people loved it. Is that where the term gaslight came from? Yeah, the gaslight treatment. Wow. Does everybody <laughs> here know the term gaslight? Yes. Huh? No. no. Tell us. Uh -huh. He was full of gaslight. He returned to the role of the evil husband uh, at least three more times, twice on television in the 1950s, and then another stage appearance about the same time. It was very popular. Back in films, he played Joseph Smith, the founder of uh, Mormonism. Woohoo! Pretty uh, young. And his death scene in this was, was pretty, pretty brutal for uh, 1940. Peter <laughs> <laughs> Charles on the right with all the curls and, and everything in Hudson's Bay. Oh, yeah. And then he played a real villain in The Song of Bernadette. Oh. Remember that movie? It was uh, Oscar nominated that year. And he played the guy who cast all kinds of doubt on the young girl who seems a virgin area in the grotto. But at the end, he finds himself sick and he comes and he begs for forgiveness. He even appeared on Broadway for a short time as Abraham Lincoln. And somebody was telling me that he had played the part again in about 1980 for uh, a benefit in Washington. Yeah. But his, his favorite film of all the films he made, and he made a, a round of 100 films, was Laura uh, with Gene Tierney. He loved the whole experience of making it, and it was a great film, it still is. He played a total cat named Shelby Carpenter. And if anybody hasn't seen it, you really should get a hold of it. It's coming out on Blu-ray very shortly. Uh, the song is The song, David Braxton's song, yeah. And then he continued in costume epics for a while. And again, nobody seemed to know what to do with him. On the left is uh, the Royal Scandal he made with uh, Tallulah Bankhead. And on the right was a short but really powerful role in Leave Her to Heaven, which is another one that really uh, holds up very well after all these years. <clears throat> then a little film called Shock came up. Uh, it was a low-budget film. It was designed to be the second half of a double bill. And he was given the starring role as an evil psychiatrist. <coughs> Excuse me. He uh, did so well, the film did so well, that it ended up playing the top of a double bill. And it pretty much cemented in the minds of producers the kind of part that he was perfect for, that of the villain. His next film, though, uh, came as a result of that one, because if he hadn't made shock, I don't think they would have considered him for Dragon Wick. Dragonwick was supposed to star Gregory Peck. Peck had to bow out because he had another project, and so they shuffled Vincent Price into the park. And uh, anybody seen Dragonwick? It's another time story. It takes place in the Hudson Valley, um, and the, the, uh, the book that it's based on opens with a quote by Edgar Allan Poe. So it's sort of prophetic because he ended up doing Poe films in the 1960s. That's him in the Costume test. The casting seemed perfect because he was both evil and romantic. <laughs> Along the same time, he was establishing himself in Hollywood as uh, uh, an art expert. And he and fellow actor George McCready opened the Little Gallery, uh, which had its mission of exposing new artists to the public. Uh, he enjoyed the classics, but his big passion was bringing new artists to the, the consciousness of the, the art public. By 1949, Vincent and Edith Samir Richards were falling apart, and so they divorced. So after that, he married film and costume designer Mary Grant. Uh, she shared uh, his passion for art. He also began his long run on television with the narration of an adaptation of A Christmas Carol in 1949. And you can see this on YouTube. It's out there for everybody to see. It's not too, it's not too great. The production values are too hot. And you really kind of wish Vincent was playing Scrooge. <laughs> but in the next 45 years, he appeared on game shows, dramas, talk shows, comedies, westerns, you name it. He even hosted The Tonight Show several times for Johnny Carson. In 1950-51, uh, his career consisted of a string of comedies, and he played these outrageous handy characters. 
This one was a curtain call at Cactus Creek with Walter Brennan and E. Barton. And then I think the best comedy role he ever did was this insane soap tycoon in a movie called Champagne for Caesar. <laughs> and it is hysterical. If you ever get a chance to see this movie, you will see not what do you think it's let's see parts. The title again? Champagne for Caesar. For Caesar? Yep. Caesar is a parrot in the movie. Oh, then after House of Wax, he was back in 3D as the Mad Magician, 1952. But he also did little films that really people don't know about these days. This one was called Pictura, and it's about uh, promotion of the arts to young people. Uh, his knowledge of art uh, became very well known when he appeared on a series of episodes of the $64,000 Challenge on television. He was pitted against fellow art uh, experts, Edward G. Robinson, the actor, and uh, Bill Pearson, the jockey. And it, it was amazing. These people knew all the answers to all the questions. In fact, for a while, they even, uh, the public sort of started to wonder if it wasn't some kind of a, a scandal <clears throat> that they were given the answers. But all three men knew exactly what I was talking about. Here he is strangling Alfred Hitchcock on uh, the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Hitchcock doesn't seem to mind. And in 1962, he and Mary welcomed Victoria Price to the household. The time between Victoria's birth and his son Vincent's birth was 22 years. Wow. And Vincent Price would refer to that as Planned Parenthood in his <laughs> finest form. <laughs> The 1960s saw his most prolific screen work, uh, beginning with a series of films directed by Roger Corman, based on the works of Edgar Allan Poe, Fall of the House of Usher, in 1960. Hit the Pendulum, 1961. Tales of Terror, 1962. The Raven and the Haunted Palace, 1963. It's funny, though, The Haunted Palace is actually based on a story by H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer. But he, he gets a tiny little print. They like that poke, though. Mask of the Red Death, 1964. And finally, Tomb of Lygia, in 1965. And it's funny because you watch Tomb of Lygia, and you realize that it's the first poem film to have any outdoor scenes. All the other films were filmed in the studio, and it looks like it. Tomb of Lygia, they actually sprang from big bucks and went to England and filmed around these ruined abbeys and beautiful houses. And it's a gorgeous film for you. On the 1962, Sears Roebuck came up with a very unusual plan. They wanted to allow, they wanted to make it possible for everyday people to buy fine works of art. So they got up to Vincent Price, told him these ideas, uh, that they wanted him to travel around, find works of art, acquire them for Sears, and uh, sell them in Sears stores around the country. And these, these included works by Rembrandt, Goya, Picasso. This is, this is actually these are two pages from a catalog uh, they put together. And there are prices under the pictures. You can actually go in here in Rochester. Uh, he came to Rochester at one point in the 60s and uh, brought this huge collection of, of fine art with him. But he also went around and commissioned, again, new artists to create art so that they could sell those alongside the old masters. Was he Rochester? Did he present at a Sears store? Yep, the one on the row Avenue. That's cool. Yep. I, used, I worked there in the late 70s. And I kept hoping I'd run across something. <laughs> Actually, this piece here is, is from the, the Vincent Price series collection. It's got the sticker on the back. Uh, Mary Price actually framed each and every work that Sears sold. This is a, a, a wood lock that would have been used for printing, and they just put it in a shadow box kind of thing and sold it. It probably was one of the lower end items. I couldn't afford one of the, the Rembrandts. Um, but it does have the sticker on the back, and unfortunately the bottom part of the sticker, which told you more about the work, is missing. But it says uh, 19th century anonymous French engraved woodwork.
So he was making movies all over the world anyway, so it was just, he'd always duck out and, and check out the uh, art shops for series. He and Mary also produced uh, one of the best-selling cookbooks uh, ever made, The Treasury <laughs> of Great Recipes. And I brought a copy today if you want to come up after and take a look at it. It's just been republished by Stoddard of Victoria. This is an original edition. It's got a padded cover. I mean, you're almost afraid to take it in the kitchen. <coughs> but people still swear by it. Then on television, he continued appearing in shows that were popular, like Batman, Furious, and Egghead. He loved the part of Egghead, and how old would you see it in three months because he's just crazy. In 1968, he made what a lot of people consider to be his best horror film, Witchfinder General. Over here, it was known as The Conqueror Worm, because the studio was still in love with Poe, and so they retitled it the Poe poem title, just to keep it Poe-esque. But Witchfinder General is what it's known as, and it's uh, a violent, grim film, and it uh, features one of his really greatest performances. It's totally beautiful. <clears throat> Back to Broadway in 1968 to appear in a musical called Darling of the Day. And the woman he's appearing with, you probably don't recognize this, Patricia Routledge, uh, Hyacinth Bouquet herself, oh, which was the female lead. Oh. <laughs> the early 70s saw two of his more most famous roles with his uh, fans, The Abominable Dr. Vibes yes. on the left, 1971. And on the right, he played Edward Lionheart, the uh, Shakespearean actor in Theater of Blood. Both of these films are really similar in that he's a man who's been wronged and he's killing the people he considers to be, to have done that wrong to him in various unusual ways. In Dr. Fives, he uses the curses of the Bible, the Old Testament, to kill the doctors who let his wife die. And Theater of Blood, he uses the, uh, <clears throat> he uses deaths inspired by Shakespeare uh, to kill the critics who gave him bad notices. <laughs> <laughs> One of the critics who gets fried in the beauty chair was Carl Brown, the actress, the Australian actress. Uh, the two became, uh, well, they became an item. And his marriage, second marriage to Mary Grant, was also falling apart. So after he divorced Mary, he married Pearl Brown. In the 70s, he did a record album with Alice Cooper. Uh, Welcome to My Nightmare. Yep, he did the narration. And he actually appeared on stage with Cooper in a couple of concerts. Ten years later, of course, he did that, that was rapid at the end of uh, Michael Jackson's uh, Road, which is what a lot of young people know him as exclusively. He toured with his wife and their good friend Rod, Roddy McDowell in Charlie's Aunt in the 1970s. But his biggest success, maybe of his entire life, was Diversions and Delights which was a one-man play in which he per, uh, portrayed Oscar Wilde. Uh, he started out on Broadway, it ran for a short time there, and then he toured around the world with it. He went to Australia, he went to Russia, he went to England, he came to Rochester. Question? He, yeah. Is the name John Gay there meant to be that's, suggestive? No, that's the actual, that's the author's name. That's what I'm, okay. Yep. Curious coincidence. Yeah, no, it is. I know I've always thought that. Um, but, he was extremely successful. Uh, he came to Nazareth, uh, and in my diary from the time, I wrote, to Nazareth to see Vincent Price as Oscar Wilde, all of the case letters. Fantastic. And I met Vincent Price afterwards. Oh. Had a conversation with him. Great guy. People, and he stopped at each and every person and talked to us. Yes? Was there any rumors that he was gay? Because he had a bad list. His, <laughs> list. His daughter has said it's entirely possible he was bisexual. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Michael Jackson's thriller. Yep. What did you do with it? Yeah. At the end of the song Thriller, yeah. is this narrator doing this monologue? Yes. That's Vincent Price. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. No. 
No, he never won any major awards. He won all kinds of genre awards for horror films, but uh, he was a presenter several times at the Oscars, but he never won anything. He wasn't even nominated. And a couple of films he certainly should have been. He's that thing. But you know what happens? Yeah. Yeah. Theater Blood, I think, should have been, he should have been another film coming up in just a couple seconds here, but I think he and at least two of his uh, co-stars should have been nominated for Oscars. But anyway, after appearing in uh, Diversions and Delights for several years, he and Coral actually had their own television series. Uh, it was an eight-episode series called uh, Time Express, which is sort of a, a fantasy island kind of thing, except it took place on a train. And he and his wife would be sort of ghosts and hosts. And they take people back to crucial moments of their lives where they had the chance to change things for the better. But it was kind of nice that they had the chance to do that together. He also did a children's show on Disney called Read, Write, and Draw, where kids would send in uh, drawings that they made from things that they'd read. And he would show them on, on television. Tim Burton. Uh, cast him, asked him, before he was anybody, if uh, he would narrate this short film he made about a, a young boy who aspired to be Vincent Price. And the movie was called Vincent. And of course, Price said yes immediately. And he said, this is the best kind of immortality. <laughs> again, you, you, you can find this on uh, YouTube. It's a really cute film. <clears throat> In the late 1980s, his health was beginning to decline, and he started choosing projects that he only really wanted to start. Um, this one, The Whales of August, uh, uh, recast him. Remember I said he appeared in Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex with Betty Davis? She was in this film, too. It was one of her last films. She's down in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, Betty Davis and Lillian Gish played sisters and a good friend of theirs was played by Ann Seller. So it was all these old timers. So What's that? The only one they got together for, yes. Lillian Gishduck did not make another film. Betty Davis made another couple inconsequential movies. Ann Seller, I'm not sure she ever did. Uh, Vincent Price did make a couple more films after this. But it's a beautiful movie. Uh, very slow, but very gentle. He, he should have been nominated, I think, as Best Supporting Actor. But Lillian Gish certainly should have been nominated for Best Actress. She gives an incredible performance for somebody during a hundred special. Coral Brown was diagnosed with breast cancer and died in 1991. Who was that? Coral Brown, his wife. Price himself became ill with Parkinson's, uh, emphysema, and finally lung cancer. He was a smoker his entire life. What year did he pass? 1993. Tim Burton provided his idol with one final really memorable role, that of the inventor in Edward Scissorhands. Uh, you see the film, it was supposed to, it, it's a delight to see him. He was supposed to have had a much larger role, but he was uh, too uh, infirm for uh, his health problems. But we're lucky to have what we have. Obviously ill. Vincent remained a public figure, often in the company of his devoted daughter, Victoria. This photo, which was taken by Victoria shortly before her father's death, shows that Vincent Price's sense of fun and his zest for life remained largely undiminished. She always had him occupied with some kind of a, a fun thing, where people were always filling the house. She said there was a lot of that, even in those last days. Vincent Price died the week before Halloween in 1993. He was 83 years old. And I'm not ashamed to say that I cried when I found out that he, he passed. A man who limits his interests limits his life is one of his uh, favorite sayings, and he certainly lived those words. His legacy uh, continues, and his accomplishments, there are just too many. I mean, the things that Everything you want, wanted to know about Vincent Price, but we're afraid to ask. I can't begin to include everything. You'd all be falling asleep by the time I got done with it. But he was commissioner of the Federal Indian Arts and Crafts Board from the 1950s through the 1960s. 
He was an honorary member of the board of parents, families, and friends of lesbians and gays, and one of the first celebrities to appear in public service announcements discussing AIDS. He authored four major cookbooks. He authored a syndicated column on art from 1965 to 1969. This is while doing all those movies, all those plays, all those television shows. I don't think the man ever, ever rested. And he would answer every fan letter personally. I wrote to him several times. I always got a response. He was just incredible. His son uh, is now noted poet, teacher, and anthropologist, known as B.B. Price. He remains a champion of social and environmental causes. His daughter, Victoria, I met her last October, so I put that picture in. Uh, seen here with me last October, the House of Seven Gables in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, keeps her father's ideas and ideals alive as she tours the world. That's her dog, Allie, who goes everywhere with her. And she's a, and she's and she, a lesbian. Yes, she is. The House of Seven Gables are literally, that existed? That's the house. Yep, it's the house. house across the street from the Witch Museum. It's uh, very close. Just down the street. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I lived across the bridge. Oh, did you? And, uh, and uh, oh, okay. literally right across the bridge yep. right here. Yep. Um, the house is what inspired Hawthorne to write his, uh, his book. Is it a museum now? Yes. Or private? Oh, okay. It's a museum. Right. It's beautiful. You can just walk outside. It's beautiful to see. It is. So that's cute. Tim Burton, after Vincent's death, even fashioned a character after his likeness in the 2012 movie Frankenweenie. And a character voiced originally by Vincent in the 1985 Scooby-Doo movie is back in a new Scooby-Doo film with a spot-on Vincent Price impersonation. I guess it's just like it. And the short animated film by my friend Ben Wicke, an adaptation of The House of Seven Gables, features a character who just happens to look like you know who. His legacy includes the art museum bearing his name at Los East Los Angeles College, which is a community college. <clears throat> he found out that this community college, which was underserved and attended by mostly minorities, had no art collection. So he and Mary donated the core of their own art collection to East Los Angeles College. And that became the nucleus of this beautiful museum. And he, as you can see from the picture, uh, he would return there often to, uh, to see them. Did he have brothers or sisters? He's the youngest of four. Yep. He will live on. This is from his cooking show. <laughs> in uh, England in the early 70s. He had a cooking show on television? Yep, in England. Yep. In England. Yep. Uh, this is uh, from uh, a TV movie called uh, Snoop Sisters. You remember with Helen Hayes and Mildred Natwick years ago? It reteamed him with Helen Hayes from his first stage show, uh, Victoria Regina. And this is him with the uh, Aboriginal mask that he had in the backyard of his home. And his fans will always be grateful for the fact that he really seemed to care about us. And that's one of the pictures he signed for me. And that's it. Does anybody